All right, take your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the title of the sermon this morning is The Spirit of God, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, however you want to term it, but the Spirit of God is what we see as one of the major themes here in, in chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians. Uh, and remember, keep in mind that this church is not the greatest church. Just keep that in mind because some of these things, and, and again, another good reason to go for the book of 1 Corinthians, especially as a new church, is because Paul is teaching them the milk of the Word of God. Paul is saying, look, I can't teach you spiritual things. I can't teach you the deep things of God. I've got to go back and instruct you in the milk. So it's a really good book, again, not just to fall into the trap of being a bad church like the Corinthian church was during this time, but also just to get into that milk, just to get into those foundations, which is important for a new church like ours. But let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. Paul says to the Corinthian church, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech uh, or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. So the first thing that I want you to notice is that even though Paul, even though Paul was an educated man, even though he was educated as a Pharisee of the law, Right? He was someone that knew the scriptures. He was someone that knew the law of God very well. You know, he's not some country bumpkin that can't speak. But even though he was highly educated, even though that he knew the word of God, even though he, had this, he was a zealous person, even to the point of persecuting the church of God, he says to you, when I came to you, I did not come with excellency of speech or of wisdom. He's talking there, and you get this in the context of the chapter, he's talking about the wisdom of man. He didn't come with his own wisdom. He didn't come with trying to impress you with his speech. He didn't come with new fancy doctrines that nobody else had heard of. He came with simplicity. He came teaching the brethren. And that's why he, he's so good at teaching this Corinthian church, because they're so bad, they're so, uh, they've, they've lost their ways. You know, he can speak to them at their level. I don't know if you've ever been to churches when the pastor's preaching or the, the preacher's and he's like talking over the people, right? He's using these excellency of words. He's using these huge, big words, showing his education. And people are like, and I, you know, I hear, I hear from people, I didn't understand what that was about. I, I don't know what he said. What was he saying? Because it was over their head. He came speaking, trying to speak with wisdom and excellency of speech of man, right? Not Paul, you know, and not in this church. You know, if you're a preacher, you stand behind this pulpit and you open up the Word of God, I want you to be mindful of a few things. Number one, be mindful that, yes, many of us are believers. I think most, you know, pretty much everyone is, except for the little ones. But be mindful that there are children in the congregation. So you want to make sure when you preach, you know, you're not just preaching to some seasoned Christian that understands all the deep things of God. You've got to find a balance. You've got to make sure that parts of your sermon are easily to understand and easily to digest, right? Because there are children, and that's what they're going to learn. That's what they're going to pick up. But then you also want to mix in some meat. You want to mix in all of it so it's a good meal for everybody, right? And again, just because you've been saved for 20, 30 years doesn't mean you're a mature Christian. Someone that, can be, that could be saved for 20, 30 years could still be a baby in Christ, right? Different people are at different levels in their Christianity. We're, we're developing at different rates, right? Obviously, if you spend your time in the Bible, you spend your time studying God's Word, you spend your time fellowshipping with the Lord, you spend your time preaching the Gospel to the lost, you're going to grow a lot faster than someone that's been sta saved and is in a stale church that doesn't motivate them, doesn't encourage them to do anything for the Lord. So just keep in mind that when you're preaching behind the pulpit, you're preaching to people of all types of backgrounds, all types of experience, all types of ages, saved for many years, some saved for not long at all. <clears throat> so please keep that in mind that there are deep people in different stages of spiritual growth. Paul did not come to edify himself and showing how wise he was. Okay, that wasn't his plan. Verse number two. What was his plan? Why did he come? Verse number two. For I determined not to know anything among you. He goes, Look, I, I didn't come here trying to show you that I have all this wisdom save or accept Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's what I know, Paul says. That's what I've come preaching. Jesus Christ and His crucifixion. Jesus Christ and the Gospel. That's what He's come preaching and not showing His own personal wisdom. <clears throat> now, here's the thing. You might say, well, hold on, Kevin. Are you saying 
that all Paul preached was the gospel to the Corinthian church. Now, obviously, if you read the letter, you know, he's covered, covering many topics, but everything that should be preached behind a church, behind a pulpit, ought to be based on the foundation, which is Jesus Christ and his crucifixion, right? Every doctrine that you know in the Bible, whether you realize this or not, is somehow based on Christ and his crucifixion. Every doctrine, anything that's being preached is based on Christ. Christ is the central focus of the Bible. Everything in the Old Testament was leading up, pointing us to Christ. And everything that we read about in the New Testament points back to Christ and what he's done in our lives. You might say, well, uh, give me some examples. Okay, end times. You know, we want to know about end times. Yeah, it's about Christ. It's about Christ coming back and establishing his kingdom. What about creation? Yeah, Christ was the creator. Christ created all things. Okay? Jesus Christ says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending. Right? If you come to a church and someone preaches some feel-good message and you're like, was that even about Christ? Then that wasn't even something that was preached from the, God, from the Bible. It was preaching from the wisdom of man. It was preaching, uplifting, up, um, and, uh, glorifying man rather than glorifying Christ. Well, what about the sacrifices? You know, the other doctrines. Yeah, it points to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. What about the law and the commandments? You know, the Old Testament's full of commandments and laws, right, that we ought to follow. Yeah, Christ fulfilled the law and the commandments, right? Christ was able to, he was the only one that was able to keep all the laws and the commandments perfectly, something that we cannot do. So we realize that we fall short of the glory of God and we need Jesus Christ as our Savior. But what about marriage, the doctrine of marriage, husband and wife? Yeah, husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church, all right? It's always pointing back to Christ. You know, children, obey your parents. Yeah, you know why? Because Jesus Christ, the Son of God, obeyed the Father. Okay, he set us our example. What about rep the doctrine of reprobates, right? The reprobate doctrine. I haven't preached on that yet, but you guys know what I'm talking about. Yeah, they rejected Christ. So God has rejected them. Okay, it's all on Christ. What about doctrines where we teach about, you know, having to serve one another? Right? Hold, uh, esteeming one another higher than you uh, esteem yourself. You know, serving one. Yeah. You know, because Christ says when you serve your brethren, do it as though you're serving him, as though you're serving Christ. What about being a good employee? Yeah. Be an employee as though you're working for Christ. Every doctrine in the Bible somehow is centered on Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's what Paul came preaching. Again, if you go to church and you go like, well, was that, how was that about Christ? Then, yeah, it wasn't, wasn't biblical teaching, right? It wasn't what, how, you know, and, and 1 Corinthians chapter 2, if you want to be a preacher, if you want to be a pastor, this is a good chapter to study. This is a really good chapter to study because it brings you back to what is the purpose of preaching? What is the purpose of teaching? You know, do I have to be so highly educated with my, you know, do I need to show off and people go, wow, oh, that's a great preacher, look at him. No, all you need to do is preach Christ and him crucified. That's all you need to do. Bring the wisdom of God to your preaching rather than the wisdom of man. Uh, verse number three. And I was with you in weakness. So how does Paul look at himself? Does he think of himself as this high and mighty preacher? Strong in the Lord. We look at Paul and we go, man, this guy was strong in the Lord, right? But how does Paul reflect upon himself? himself? He says, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Is that the picture you get of Paul when you read, you know, the book of Acts and you see, you know, what he went through? Do you see? No, not really, right? Because we see God exalting Paul, whereas Paul himself says, hey, I'm a weak man. I've got fears. I tremble, you know. I've got, you know, when I was with you, I was, in, I was in that state. That's Paul humility, okay? You know, Paul seems like this fantastic man in the Bible, and he was, right? But if you knew him personally, you know, he was open about his weaknesses, right? You know, he wasn't someone exalting himself. We read about Paul being a great man because it's God who exalts him. He had fear and trembling. And let me say to you, there ought to be a healthy dose of fear when you preach the Word of God. There ought to be a healthy dose of fear in you when you preach to the lost, but there also should be a healthy fear of God when you preach um, at church, right? If you get behind the pulpit and you know you're going to preach to the uh, people of God, you're going to preach to your brethren, you ought to have a healthy dose of fear. If this ought to be not to be, okay, yeah, I'm so confident in myself, I'm so confident in what I'm going to preach, you know, I'm going to amaze them with my wisdom. No, you know, I, I promise you this. 
Before I stand here, I'm always fearful. I'm always afraid. I always say to the Lord, Lord, you know, please help me to preach your word without error, you know. Um, Calvin, do you mind just checking if that guy wants to come in? Yeah. I'm not sure if it's after us yeah. or something else. Thanks, Callum. All right, so, you know, it's a good thing. Don't think, you know, if, if, if before you preach, if you're a little nervous, if you're a little fearful, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. A fear of the Lord is a good thing because it's going to make sure, you know, it's going to do a few things. It's, first of all, it's going to cause you to draw upon God for your strength rather than draw upon yourself for strength. Number two, it's going to make you more careful when you study God's Word because you want to make sure that what you're teaching is correct and sound doctrine, okay? And that healthy dose of fear is going to cause you to want to please the Lord rather than please man, okay? So that's why I'm saying to you, this chapter is a good chapter if you want to be a preacher, if you want to be a pastor. Study it and focus on it, meditate on it because Paul gives a lot of good advice of what you ought to be as a preacher, Verse number 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Okay, think about that. So Paul comes to the Corinthian church. You know I'm weak. You know I have fears. You know I have trembling. But that just demonstrates when I preach that I have the power of God, that I have the Spirit of God, because I'm not relying on myself. Okay? And if you want to be, again, a bold preacher, you want to sound the Word of God strongly, you want to encourage your fellow brothers, you want to glorify God in your preaching, you need the Spirit of God. You need His power. You are demonstrating when you preach the power of God in your life. Okay? God will use you despite your weaknesses. God will use you despite your weaknesses because it allows God to work His Spirit and power in you. Okay? The other thing is, He's not preaching with enticing words of man's wisdom, right? So what is He preaching with? If He's not using man's wisdom, He's obviously using the Scriptures, right? When you hear preaching, the preaching ought to have a lot of Scriptures in it. In fact, the more Scripture it has, the better it's going to be for you because the more scripture is more God's word and less man's opinions and, and man's wisdom, right? And I, I don't know about you, but I despise, I hate preaching when it's like this one verse, right? Oh, let's, you know, you start off, okay, let's read this one verse and then for the next 20 minutes, and usually they're very short sermons anyway, for the next 20 minutes it's just the guy just speaking, right? Just, just exp uh, teaching about his life and teaching about his experiences and you're like, I want more Bible. Why? Because... I don't, I don't know if you feel that way, because the Bible is the bread. It's spiritual bread for your soul, right? That's why when people talk about pre hearing preaching or reading the Bible, they talk about being fed. You know, that was a good sermon. I felt really fed. Or sometimes you go and you don't feel fed. You don't feel like, I, I didn't learn anything that time. Because the Word of God is the bread of your spirit. The more scripture you have, the more the Word of God you have in your preaching, the more powerful it's going to be, the more it's going to fill uh, the, the hearer uh, and feed the spirit of that person and make them satisfied. Preaching ought to be the words of God, not the enticing words of man's wisdom, right? Now, I'm not against having jokes in your sermon. You know, I'm not against um, having some story to help draw some, uh, you know, uh, some analogy or some illustration of doctrine. But again, don't be a preacher. Don't be a preacher that's your whole sermon's filled with stories. Right? Your whole sermon's filled with glorifying yourself or filled with stories of men in the 1700s, in the 1800s. We don't even know if these men were saved. You know, we have these stories. You know, I've, been, I've heard preaching where, you know, there'd be three or four stories about some man in the 1800s that I don't even know. I don't even know if he was saved, you know. And uh, oh, what about the modern, modern style of preaching? You know, they go watch some Hollywood movie and then they say, oh, you know, I don't recommend you to watch that movie, but there was this good scene that really illustrates this point in the Bible. You know, that's, you know, well, th there's one thing about using man's wisdom, but then you go to Hollywood, which is man's foolishness, and you take the foolishness of man, and you're trying to teach the wisdom of God using the foolishness of man. It's bad enough to use man's wisdom to teach the wisdom of God. It's how much worse it is to take man's foolishness to teach the wisdom of God. 
All right, I, I told some of you guys, I went to a, to a church in Adelaide, and the preacher was using a movie called World War Z, which is about some zombie apocalypse, you know, to teach, I don't even know what he taught, but to teach some truth in the Bible. Or he uses, you know, he, was, he also mentioned Superman and Kryptonite, you know. Uh, now I'm using these illustrations. <laughs> Look how bad I've got it. <laughs> no, but he was using Superman and Kryptonite and how Kryptonite makes him weak, somehow illustrating some point in the Bible about the Christian life. That, that is man's wisdom. In fact, it's man's foolishness. That ought to be not, that not ought to be the way you preach. Okay? You use, I prefer hearing your stories. I want to know about your personal life. You know, what are your experiences? What are your weaknesses? How has God come through in your life? You know, your soul winning stories. What did you do last week when you went soul winning? Do you have a good, good illustration there that can help build, you know, the teaching of God's word? Okay? So sermons with one Bible verse, that's not God's wisdom. Sermons with Hollywood stories and Hollywood movies, that's not God's wisdom. Uh, sermons where men go back to the Greek, go back to the Hebrew, right? What's that? Oh, look, I've learned Greek. I did one semester of Greek in some Bible college. I've done one semester of Hebrew in Bible college. It doesn't mean anything to us. We speak English. We have the King James Bible, which is God's perfect, preserved Word of God. That's sufficient for us. All right? We don't need to go back to the Greek and the Hebrew. Now you say, Kevin, are you against the Greek and the Hebrew? No, I'm not against the Greek and the Hebrew. Right? In fact, I've gone back to the Greek and the Hebrew a couple of times in my sermons. But this is, look, if they were legitimately going back to, Greek, to the Greek text, legitimately going back to the Hebrew text, I'd be okay with that. I really wouldn't have a problem with that because I esteem those texts as highly as I esteem my English translation. Okay? But that's not what they do. When they say, I'm going back to the Greek, you know where they're going? They're going to James Strong. Strong's Concordance. I've gone back to the... No, you've gone back to James Strong. You know, what, you know when preachers stand and say, hey, I'm going back to the Greek... What if they said to you, I'm going to James Strong? You'd be like, who's James Strong? Was this man even saved? Did he even believe the King James Bible? First of all, I don't even know if he was saved. And secondly, he didn't believe in the King James Bible, right? He preferred the modern, uh, you know, discoveries that were used in all the modern Bibles anyway. So what you're getting when you go back to James Strong, when you go back to Strong's Concordance, all you're getting is the NIV uh, explanation of, of certain, you know, Greek words or Hebrew words. That's all you're getting. The other one is, is uh, Young, Young's Concordance or Young something. Um, that's uh, Robert Young. Again, I'm going back to... Do they say I'm going back to Robert Young? Let me tell you what Robert Young is teaching about here. Or am I going back to James Strong? No, I'm going back to the Greek and the Hebrew. So the people in the congregation think, wow, this person has so much knowledge. Wow, look what he's learned. No, he's just going to another man. We don't even know. He's not even a Baptist. Right? If that person, ex you know, in Baptist church, if that person was alive today, Baptist pastors would not get him to stand behind the pulpit and preach, but yet they go back and get that knowledge of, of what they wrote and teach it to the congregation. It's, it's just as bad. Okay? This is man's wisdom. No. You know, look, I've actually never been to a church where the pastor's gone back to the Greek or Hebrew to correct the English. I I've never seen that. Well, I mean, I've seen that but I've never been in a church that does that, right? The churches that I've been to, you know, one, one of the funny things was he came across uh, the word cut in the, new t in the Bible, like the English word cut, you know, and then he says, I'm going back to the Greek, and in the Greek, that word, whatever the Greek word was, means a sharp divide. And I'm thinking, yeah, that's what, that's what cut means. That's, what, that's English. I mean, did you, did you have to go back to the Greek? Now, look, at least... He's not, you know, correcting what the English says, right? That's what some pastors do. They change what the Bible says, going back to the Greek and the Hebrew. He's just saying, look, the Greek word is, is cut, cut is this, means sharp divide. Yeah, I just rolled my eyes thinking, yeah, you could have just said that's what English word means, right? If I looked up cut in the, in the dictionary, that's what it means, a sharp divide. I mean, what, what, you know, but, you know, that's man's wisdom. Man, man thinks I need to go back and talk about these languages so I can impress the congregation. No, you've got the perfect Word of God here in English, and I expect you, if you're going to stand and preach behind this pulpit, that you will use this book and not the wisdom of man, okay? Because it glorifies man. It glorifies James Strong. It glorifies the preacher when they go back to these men to teach the Bible. Now, verse number 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5. 
that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So our faith, how ought it to stand? If we're going to be firm, grounded Christians, is it going to stand in the wisdom of man, or does it stand in the power of God? The power of God, right? The power of God. Now, here's the thing. When you, I don't know if you've ever, you know, I mean, many of you haven't been to church for a long time. You know, I've gone to church pretty much my whole life. And I've met people that appeared to be, you know, righteous, strong Christian people, but then something goes wrong, something, they get discouraged, and then they're out of church, right? Or they don't want to do any more, they don't want to, any more, want to know more about God. They don't want to read the Bibles anymore. They, they're completely switched off. That person's faith, Okay, if, you, if you're someone that backslides to the point where you just don't want anything to do with God anymore, it's because your faith was founded upon men. That's why. It was founded upon your preacher. It was founded upon men in the past. I've come across people like this. You know, I'm thinking of one, one friend in particular that seemed really strong in the Lord. You know, he'd go back. You know, he was real Baptist. Like, it was such a Baptist. You know, he knew all the Baptist history. He knew all the Baptist great names in history. And I was concerned. I was concerned for him because I didn't hear him talking about Christ. I didn't hear him talking about the words of God. All I heard was praise of men. And guess what? Out of church, you know? Because his faith was grounded. It was built upon men and the worship and the praise of men rather than the power of God. If your faith is based on the power of God, it's going to last, okay? Even when you get discouraged, even when you get demotivated, even when your favorite preacher commits some sin and, and you're really upset about it, if your faith is based on Christ and His words, it's going to stand firm, it's going to stand grounded in the faith. Verse number six, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. So even though Paul says, like, I haven't come with enticing words and man's wisdom, he says, even though that's not how I come, what we come preaching is still wisdom. It's still wise. It's the wisdom of God. Guys, you have the wisdom of God. You have the power of God. If you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit indwelling in you. You've been born of the Spirit of God. Your eyes are open. You can read this book. You can read and understand this book and you can teach this book. That is a demonstration of God's power and God's wisdom in your life. You have a lot more power than you realize. You have a lot more influence than you realize. Right? In the spiritual realm, the, you know, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, the Bible says. Right? You have power over sin. You have power over the world. You have power over Satan and the forces of Satan. Not because of you, but because of Christ who lives in you through the Holy Ghost, through the Holy Spirit. Okay, So even though we don't come preaching man's wisdom, we come preaching instead a greater wisdom. That greater wisdom being the wisdom and the power of God. And one thing that you'll notice in this chapter is this, the power and the wisdom. There are the two main things that you're going to find in this, in this chapter. You know, the power and the wisdom. Chapter 1, it was knowledge and utterance. Chapter 2, it's power and wisdom. When, when you see these phrases over and over again, what you always need to think about is, this makes you a balanced Christian. This makes you a strong Christian. I need both the power and I need the wisdom. And both the power and the wisdom come from the Word of God through the leading of the Holy Ghost, through the leading of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> uh, verse number seven. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Now this is interesting. The wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. So we have, and this is what I was just alluding to earlier, we have the hidden wisdom of God available to us. The wisdom of God is a mystery. This book to the world is mysterious. They cannot understand the words of God. And yet you can. You have the mystery revealed to you through the Holy Ghost. The hidden wisdom, the Bible says. The hidden wisdom. You know, I don't know if you're ever interested in mysteries, you know, like, you know, unsolved cases and mysteries. And I don't know if you've ever heard some of these stories, you know, of, of certain crimes and no one's worked out how it happened. Or, you know, it's mysterious. It's like, man, I really wish I knew how that, how, what happened there. Well, God's given you 
the knowledge of His mysteries. God's giving you the, the knowledge of His wisdom. There are people in this world that look at this book and they go, I don't know, I wish I knew what's in there. I wish I understood what was in there. You have the ability to teach them. I'm not talking necessarily about you even standing behind the pulpit and preaching. I'm just saying to your friends, to your family, out door knocking, you know, how many people don't even know how to get to heaven? They don't even, it's a free gift. How, how easy is salvation for us? Like when we think about what salvation is, isn't it like the most simple doctrine ever? I mean, if you, if you looked at all the doctrines in the Bible, wouldn't you say, yep, salvation by grace through faith and not of works, that's super easy to understand, that gives me the confidence that I cannot lose my salvation because Christ paid it all. And yet, how many people, when you ask them that question out here, don't even know what they need to do to be saved? It's mysterious, like, it's easy, but they don't get it because they don't have got the wisdom of, of God, they don't have the Holy Spirit. You have it, okay? The reason why it's easy for you to understand is because you have the hidden wisdom of God that is given to you through His Word. Verse number 8, which none of the princes of this world knew. So those in power, those in authority, don't know what you know. Think of the wisest people that the earth considers wise and knowledgeable. They don't have the wisdom that you have. They don't have the knowledge that you have. God's given you a great blessing to have His wisdom available to you, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So who, who, are those, who are those in leadership or those in authority that crucified the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, we think of Caiaphas, you know, the, the high priest. We think of Pontius Pilate, you know, the governor that crucified Christ. What's, I find this a little difficult to grasp, this verse, right? Because it says here that they, if they knew, if they knew who Christ was, if they knew he was the Son of God, it says they would not have crucified the Lord. But it was, Jesus, it was God's plan, it was Jesus' plan to be crucified, right? It was his plan to be our substitute, our sacrifice. So this is a little hard for me to grasp. So the question comes a little bit, you know, would be like, well, if they truly knew, because what he's saying is, if they truly knew Jesus was the Son of God, they truly knew he was God, they would not have crucified him, right? But he needed to be crucified. So the question is, did God cause them to be blinded to the truth so they would crucify him, you know? Did God blind their, their hearts and God blind their minds so they would crucify him? I don't believe that. I don't, I don't believe that. I believe what this is teaching is that God can use wicked men, wicked people, in spite of their weaknesses, God can use them to fulfill his purposes and his plans. Okay? In spite of their wickedness. And yes, they were wicked men. Because even though they didn't know Jesus Christ was the Son of God, they knew he was innocent. Right? Even Pilate washed his hands and said, you know, I'm a... Uh, what did he say? I'm, uh, I'm innocent of, of this man's blood. Sorry, I, I, I thought I had it in my mind. But I can't remember exactly what he quoted. But yeah, he basically acknowledges that Jesus Christ was innocent. And he knew what this, what, what, you know, being, Jesus Christ being crucified was wrong. That just shows you his wickedness. right? It shows you how wicked this man was. Even though he knew a man was innocent, he condemned him to death. Because he wanted to please man. He wanted to please the Jews. And yet God is able to use people like this for his purposes, right? To show just how foolish these people are and to enlighten us to his wisdom. Isn't it amazing that God can use wicked men, people that hate the Lord, people that hate innocent blood and still use them to fulfill his purposes? That just shows you the wisdom and the power and the might of God. Verse number 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love Him. So even to us, we talk about you know, the, 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 the Bible being mysterious to the unsaved, but even to us, there is an element of mystery. Even to us, even though God wants us to know His Word, we do not fully understand. We do not fully see what God has prepared for us. We do not fully, we never fully hear what God has prepared for us until we see Him. It says the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. And let me just give you a quick word of advice. When you read your New Testament, verse number, verse number 9, it says, but as it is written. Okay, when you read through your Bible, whenever it says, as it was spoken, or as it was written, I want you to put a little mark, or however you want to mark it. Just, just keep that in mind. And then your study, your exercise should be, 
where was that written? Where was that spoken? Can I go back to the Old Testament and see where that was written, where that was spoken? And where that was written is in Isaiah 64, verse 4. I'll just read it to you. You don't need to turn there. Isaiah 64, verse 4. The Bible says, For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, neither have the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. So the wording is a little different there, okay? But what's good about going back to the Old Testament, going back to the Hebrew, <laughs> all right, going back to the Old Testament and comparing what you see in the New Testament is it can enlighten your knowledge. It can build what you've understood, right? Because what did it say there in uh, verse number 9? You know, that, you know, we have not seen or, or heard the things which God has prepared for them that love Him, that love Him. You say, yeah, I love the Lord. But how is this love being taught here? You go back to the Old Testament and it says what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. So how do we love the Lord in context of 1 Corinthians chapter 2? We look at Isaiah 64 by waiting for him. If you're someone that's waiting for the Lord, you're looking forward to his second coming, you know, that's your hope, that's your glory. You know, you, you're, you're praying, Lord, I can't wait to see you. I hope I make it for your resurrection. I hope I can live out that period and see you. That is someone that loves the Lord, right? Jesus also said, if you love me, keep my commandments. We know that. We know that if we try to keep the commandments of, of the Lord, we are demonstrating our love toward him. But another way of loving the Lord is to those that wait for his second coming. But you probably wouldn't have even picked up on that if you just read 1 Corinthians chapter 2 on its own. You pick up on that when you go back to Isaiah, you know, as it is written, in other words, Paul is saying, hey, go back to the Scriptures so you can get a fuller understanding of what that verse is about. So, this is talking about Christ's uh, return. So when he says, you know, we can't uh, fully understand what God has prepared for us, he's talking about his return. He's talking about the millennium. He's talking about the new heavens and the new earth and the rewards in heaven, the mansions on high. Those things, yeah, we can read about it. Those things we can hope about and, and, and desire, but we... God's like saying, hey, there's more to it than you realize. There's a lot more. You know, you might read the Bible and go, it doesn't seem that interesting. There's a lot more that God has to show us uh, when that time comes, when Christ comes back. <clears throat> uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. I'll just read it to you. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but to all them that love his appearing. Are you looking forward to the time, you know, Christ's return? Or are you saying to Christ, don't come back just yet, Lord. I, there's so much more that I want to do in life. Don't come back yet. If that's you, then you're not loving his appearing, right? If you love his appearing, you want him coming back as soon as possible. You want to be a part of that and hope for that. And that's going to keep you grounded anyway, right? To keep you uh, not focused on the things that are temporal, not focused on the things of this earth, but focused on eternal matters, eternal, your, your rewards in heaven. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. Verse number 10. Verse number 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. So how does God reveal the Bible to us? We've been talking about this whole time. Through the Holy Spirit. Through His Spirit. Yea, the deep things of God. Not just the milk of the Word of God, but the deep things, right? The deep things. What does that tell us? This book is very, very deep, okay? One reading through is not going to get, is not going to, you're not going to be able to know it all just through one reading. And if you've read the Bible multiple times, you know that, right? I mean, there are times still that I read through the Bible and I'm like, I didn't even know that was in there. It's like your, your mind forgets, you know, you, you forget these things. Or sometimes you learn something, you learn a certain truth, and you've got that pretty well established, then you read it again, and you realize, hey, there's another layer of truth here. There's more applications than I realized, right? This is a very deep book. I, I've said, I think I've said this before. I think we're going to be studying this book for all eternity. I think God's going to have church in heaven, you know, the church of the firstborn, it's called, and Jesus Christ is just going to teach us from his book, like, just constantly. I, I, that's, I, it's never-ending. It's a never-ending book. Even though I'm going chapter by chapter, even if I finish all the chapters, there's still going to be things that I didn't preach on that are in this book. The deep things of God. Verse 11. For what man knoweth the things of a man... Sorry. For what man knoweth 
the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. What that's basically saying is, the reason I can relate to another man, right? If you tell me about your struggles and your difficulties, I can relate to that. I can understand. I can sympathize with you. Uh, because I'm a man. I've got the spirit of man. You've got the spirit of man. I've got the spirit of man. We can communicate. We can relate to one another. We can understand one another, right? But how do we understand God? If God has the spirit of God and we have the spirit of man, we cannot understand the things of God unless the spirit of God is in us. Unless the spirit of God has been given to us to reveal those deep things of God, right? So the only person that can understand the scriptures is the spiritual man, is the man that's been born of the Spirit, the man that is saved, that's the only one that can really understand the Word of God, right? And have you ever come across a Christian that when they talk about the Bible, it's just always wrong, right? I mean, I'm not just saying someone that's a new believer and just doesn't know that much. I'm just saying it just seems like every time they open the Bible, they just, it's always wrong. They're always misinterpreting it. They're always misunderstanding it. You know, verses about the walk, walking with the Lord, it's like, well, that's salvation. Or, You know why? You know, if you come across someone that's always wrong, just about everything, then they're not saved. They haven't got the Spirit of God in. That's one good way to know whether a man's born again. I'm not saying, look, I, could, I might even preach something that's wrong one day, and you go, oh, hold on, that was wrong. Was that, maybe Kevin's not saved. No, I'm saying someone that's always wrong. That's, you know... <laughs> Always wrong. Um, I've come across people like that. It's like, hold on, I didn't. Do you even know the gospel? You know, you know. I, I, I want to be like Paul. I, I better just preach Christ and Him crucified to you, because you know, make sure that you understand the gospel and nothing else. Um, you know, a man can understand another man because we have the same spirit, but a man can only understand God and His Word if he has the Spirit of God. Verse number twelve. Now we have received. So this is the memory verse. Now we have received. Not the spirit of this world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Freely given. It's for free. You know, people spend thousands of dollars going to the Bible college to learn the things of God. Thousands of dollars. No, it's free. Right? The things that are taught in Bible colleges ought to be taught in churches. If it's that important that someone has to pay for it, that ought to be taught in church. It's freely given, right? You come to church, I'm tell, I promise you it's free. If you never put money in the offering, you can still come. It's free, okay? It's free to come learn the Word of God, right? We don't put money in that offering to, to learn the Word of God. No, we put it there to help pay for the expenses of the church, right? That's what we do it for. We don't come, the Word of God ought to be free. I will never charge anyone to hear the Word of God. I will never have, we were talking about what, earlier, a special conference. How much did I have to pay you? $150 to go hear some false prophet. That's never going to... If, if I ever charge you money to come hear some truth, then I'm a false prophet, okay? It's free. God gave it to us freely. We give it out freely, okay? I'm never going to have... All right, guys, we're going to have a special service on Tuesday night. I'm going to teach something that I'm never going to teach in church. You know, to come, to be part of that, you're going to have to pay 100 bucks each. 100 bucks a head to know that this truth that I've, I've, I'm going to teach you. No. Then, you know, Kevin... That, that's when you know, I need to find another church. I need to find another preacher, okay? Because God's given us his knowledge freely, we ought to also give it out freely, okay? And this is the problem with Bible colleges, okay? Because to, to justify a Bible college, okay? To justify and say, well, there are deep learnings in that Bible college, then what does the preacher have to do? What does the pastor... If that pastor is supporting that Bible college, they have to make sure what they preach is pretty, pretty shallow, pretty watered down, right? Because that way, if you want to know more, then pay the big bucks and go to Bible college. Whereas if the pastor was just preaching the deep things of God, was just preaching the whole counsel of God, well, was teaching everything that's in the Word of God, then the person in the congregation doesn't have to spend the thousands of dollars to know those things, right? So if, if, if preachers, if pastors just taught everything in this book, there'd be no need for Bible college. Okay? <clears throat> but I just want to point out to you this. We talk about the spirit of man. Verse number 12 spoke about the spirit of the world. And then we also talk about the spirit of God. There are three spirits mentioned in this chapter. The spirit of man, which we all have. And then you either have one of two choices that are left. The spirit of, of the world or the spirit 
of man. And John, uh, Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 16, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. The world cannot receive the Spirit of truth. That's the Holy Spirit. Because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth in you, and shall be in you. So if you're saved, you don't have the spirit of the world. You can be influenced by the spirit of the world. You can be tempted by the spirit of the world. I would go as far as saying, I believe the spirit of the world is Satan himself, is the devil himself and his, his forces. You either have, you all have the spirit of man, but then if you're saved, you have the spirit of God, and then the unsaved, they have the spirit of the world, right? They have worldly mindsets. They think like the world, and that's why they cannot receive the things of God, because they've got the wrong spirit. If you want to know the Word of God, you must have the Spirit of God. You must be saved. So the question is, you know, yes, we have the Spirit of God, Kevin, but how can we, be, how can we have a full measure of that Spirit, right? Because the Bible speaks about being filled with the Spirit. Obviously, the more filled you are by the Spirit of God, the greater your wisdom will be, the greater your knowledge will be, the greater your power will be. The more filled you are with the Spirit, the greater your success will be at soul winning, right? So turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5, because this is a pretty important. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. Again, we have the Holy Spirit. Don't misunderstand me. If you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit indwelling in you. But we can increase that measure of the power of the Spirit of God in your life. Okay, that's when he talks about being filled with the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. How can we fill ourselves with the Spirit? How can we increase the measure of the Spirit in our lives? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. The Bible says, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So what's the opposite here of being filled with the Spirit? Being drunk. Being drunk with alcohol. Okay? So, if you're someone that wants to be filled with the Spirit, the first thing you need to do is get the alcohol out of your life, right? If you're someone that's been addicted to alcohol in the past, you know, you've gotten drunk in the past, you find pleasure in alcohol, then that's going to limit the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. That's going to limit your understanding of God's Word, right? So the first thing you need to do is get rid of the alcohol out of your life, right? If, Thankfully, I've really never been addicted to alcohol, right? It's not something that I really grew up in and, and had the effects. It doesn't tempt me. It doesn't, I don't find really any fuel. Like, I don't feel like having it. You know, I've tried it. I found it disgusting, right? But that's one way. You get rid of the alcohol if you've had that in your life. Do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Look at verse 19. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart. This is not a new sentence. Notice what it says, but be filled with the Spirit. There's a semicolon. We haven't finished the thought. Okay? So singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs is another way to fill yourself with the Spirit. You see that? This is why before we, stand, before, you know, we preach from the Word of God, why we spend time singing hymns, why we spend time singing praises to God. Yes, to praise the Lord, but to fill this church with the Spirit of God to fill the preacher with the Spirit and the power of God. That's another way to fill yourself with the Spirit, is by singing spiritual songs, by singing hymns and psalms and spiritual songs. Verse number 20, giving thanks always. You know, the, se the sentence has not ended, right? Making melody in your heart to the Lord, semicolon. It's continuing, the thought continues. Giving thanks always for all things unto God, and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> the third way to fill yourself with the Spirit is through prayer and thanksgiving. Giving thanks to the Lord. Get in the habit of thanking the Lord for answered prayer. Get in the habit of thanking the Lord for His uh, sacrifice, the Lord Jesus Christ. Get in the habit of thanking the Lord for the Holy Spirit that He's given you. Get in the habit of thanking the Lord for the church that you're in. Get in the habit of thanking the Lord because that's what's going to fill you with the Spirit. And verse 21, the thought hasn't ended, right? Semicolon. Do you see that? The name of our Lord Jesus Christ, semicolon. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Submitting yourself. What does that mean? That means I ought to be submissive to you. 
You ought to be submissive to me. We ought to be submissive to one another as brothers and sisters in the Lord. We ought to serve one another, right? We ought to look out for the needs of other people, right? We have a great example. Like today, you know, we know of one person in our church that can't be, one family that can't be here because of surgery. You know, your prayers to that person is you submitting yourself and serving that person. You know, um, looking out for their needs. I know, you know, um, you, know you guys took, took Robin over the, over the night, you know, so you had somewhere to stay. That's being submissive to one another. Those kind of things are going to fill you with the Spirit, doing what you can for other believers. And then it says here, in the fear of God. In the fear of God. So the way you serve others ought to be the way you serve the Lord. You know, if I was going to serve God, God says, Kevin, I've got this special task for you. It'd be put a bit of fear in me, right? It'd be like, man, I want to make sure I get this right. I want to make sure I do my best effort that I possibly can. I don't want to let down the Lord. That's how we ought to be with one another as brothers and sisters in the Lord, wanting to serve one another with the best of our abilities. That's going to fill you with our spirit as well. Those three things, alcohol, drunkenness, okay, uh, singing praises. Well, actually, not drinking alcohol, I should say, right? <laughs> Just like, whoops. <laughs> not drinking alcohol, not getting drunk. Singing praises, uh, thanking the Lord, and submitting, serving one another. Those four things are going to fill you with the Holy Spirit. Okay? Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13. <clears throat> which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So, who teaches you the Bible? Is it man? Or is it the Holy Ghost? It says there, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. Okay, but you're saying, well, hold on, Kevin, we're listening to your preaching, aren't you, man? Yeah, but we're preaching the Word of God. We're preaching His Word, which was written by who? The Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. So if I'm here, standing behind the pulpit, preaching to you the Word of God, then that's the Holy Spirit teaching you. That's still the Holy Ghost teaching you. God does put men and preachers and, you know, godly examples in our lives so we can learn. But as long as those, those people are following Christ, as long as those people are preaching the Word of God, then you, through that man, is being taught by the Holy Ghost. Or when you do your own private Bible reading, right? Or you talk to your fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord about the Bible. That is the teaching of the Holy Ghost. Anything that's in this book, you can learn on your own through the Holy Spirit. You don't need to come to church to learn things that you couldn't learn otherwise, okay? Everything that I preach ought to be something that you yourself can go home and have learnt that for yourself. Or maybe you already have learnt those things, right? And I'm just reminding you of certain truths that you already know. But if I start preaching something that you're like, man, I never would have come to that conclusion, then there's probably something wrong with the preacher, right? There's probably something wrong with that, with that sermon if no other Christian out there has ever heard or come to that same conclusion as someone else. Um... Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. I'll be really quick with this. But if you want to know something, you've read something in the Bible, you haven't fully understood that, that's when you need to compare spiritual with spiritual. Let me give you a few examples. Context. Okay, now, one of the things that I love preaching chapter by chapter, like, you know, we're going chapter by chapter through the Bible, is that we're always going to preach in context. You know, we get to some verse. Because um, this is the thing about topical sermons. Topical sermons are usually more interesting. Because they might hit on topics that you're really interested in, right? But with topical sermons, you tend to go from verse to verse, from to verse to verse on that topic, okay? And you, but many times you can lose the context of what that, where that verse was written. So that's one of the advantages of preaching chapter by chapter, is that whatever you preach is within the context, right? It's within the spiritual and the spiritual. Now, if you're comparing spiritual with spiritual, what are you comparing? Are you comparing the Word of God with the wisdom of man? No, because the wisdom of man is not spiritual. Are you comparing the Bible with James Strong and Robert Young? No, because they're not God. They haven't got the Spirit of God, right? When you compare spiritual with spiritual, you're comparing the Word of God with the Word of God. Some people say this, comparing Scripture with Scripture. That's what's going to increase your learning. If there's something that you don't fully understand, read other parts of the Bible that might be a parallel passage or read the context that, that that's talking about that can enrich your learning, enrich your understanding. Let me give you another example. We just did it, right? In verse number, verse number 9, we looked at, it said, as it is written. So we go, okay, where was it written? We went back to Isaiah, and we got a better understanding. That's comparing spiritual with spiritual, comparing 1 Corinthians with Isaiah, right? So the context, one way to compare spiritual with spiritual, 
Going back and looking at the Old Testament where things were previously written, that's another way to compare spiritual with spiritual. Or just looking at parallel passages. You know, we have the four Gospels. We have each Gospel talking about the life of Christ. And sometimes one Gospel has more information than another Gospel does. And so we can increase our understanding, increase our learning. And uh, that's how we do it. That's how we compare spiritual with spiritual. But it's not comparing the Word of God with something man has come up with, right? That's, that's wrong. That's wrong. Verse 14, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. But the natural man, and this is a pretty popular verse, and even though it's pretty popular, I find that it's often misunderstood. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Okay? So it's saying here that the natural man, someone that's unsaved, cannot understand the Word of God because they haven't got the Spirit of God. Okay, We understand that. That is the gist of this verse. But where I see a lot of misunderstanding is that last part where it says, because they are spiritually discerned. Okay? Now, just think about this yourself. Maybe you've got the right understanding, or maybe you don't, but it says, because they... Think about this. Who are the they? Or what is the they? That they there. What is that they? Because quite often when I've heard this verse preached, the they is the, what they would call the unnatural, the unnatural man. The, the, sorry, the natural man. Right? The person that's unsaved. They'll say because they, the unsaved, are spiritually discerned. As though somehow that means they cannot understand the Word of God. Now I agree they cannot understand the Word of God, but that's not what it's saying. Because what is discernment? If someone is discerning, it means they understand. It means that someone that can work out something, right? It's something that they can, they can look at something and they can, they can look at the Bible and work out what it says. They can look at the Bible and understand what it means. So if the they there is the natural man, the unsaved man, we have a contradiction because it says that, man, that person is spiritually discerned. It means they can understand in the spirit. Do you understand what I'm saying? So the they here... Because I want you to really understand this. Even though, even though if it's misunderstood, we still believe the same thing, but I just want you to fully understand what this verse says. The they here is the, uh, the things of the Spirit of God. L let's read it again, verse 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Okay? The things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness. So the things of God are foolishness to the natural man Neither can he know them, because they, what's they? The things of God, because the things of God are spiritually discerned. The things of God, the Word of God is spiritually discerned. The reason why you can discern the Word of God is because you're spiritual. The reason you can understand and work out what the Bible says is because you have the Holy Ghost teaching you those things. Do you understand what I'm saying? So even though it's, can be, it's often misunderstood, the gist of it we, are, we agree with, but the they there is the things of God can only be understood if you're spiritually discerned, if you're someone that can discern in the Spirit. Okay? Not that it's a big deal, but I just want you to fully understand that. Um, now, there are those that will say this, and this is where I might differ with some of you guys, and there are some people that say uh, that an unbeliever cannot understand this book whatsoever. And you'll be like, yeah, yeah, Kevin, isn't that what you've been saying? Yeah. Generally speaking, that's the truth. Okay? And one of the verses that people often go to is Acts 8, verse 29. Uh, I'll just read it to you. Acts 8, 29. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet um, Esaias and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? So this is Philip coming to the Ethiopian eunuch. Right? And he sees the Ethiopian eunuch reading from the book of Isaiah. And he asks this eunuch, can you understand what you read? Verse 31, and he said, how can I? The Ethiopian eunuch said, how can I understand what I'm reading? Except some man should guide me. And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. So he asked Philip, can you come up and sit with me and teach me what I'm reading? Right? As a general rule, yes. An unsaved man cannot understand the things of God, cannot understand the Word of God, but there is an exception, and that exception is the book of John. Because the book of John, chapter 20, verse 30, says this, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. 
So John says, look, there's many more things that I could write to you about Jesus Christ, but I'm not going to write them in this book. Verse 31. But these are written. So he says, why did I write these things in the book of John? But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ. Who's the ye? Is it the believer? No, because the believer already believes on Christ. The ye is the unbeliever. Okay, That ye, the unbeliever, might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. So the book of John is written to the unbeliever. Okay? It's written so they can believe on Jesus Christ. That is the exception. The book of John is written to the unbeliever. Okay? That tells me, and I, look, I've not come across people like, uh, you know, I don't know many people that have been saved just by reading the Bible, but that tells me that someone can read the book of John and unbeliever because it's written for them and they can believe on Jesus Christ. Okay? And I know, I know that's an exception. I know that's probably something you've not heard before. But that's what John is saying. It's, and it's not John. It's the Holy Spirit saying that. The Holy Spirit is saying, these things are written for you, unbeliever, so you would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? And then you've got that saying, the exception proves the rule. Okay? Yes, I generally agree with you that an unbeliever cannot understand the words of God, but the book of John is written for them okay, so they can understand the exception proves the rule. And that's why whenever you do a gospel presentation, whenever you go soul winning, you know, ha have you heard of the Romans road of soul winning? Where people use just the book of Romans, just the book of Romans to teach people about salvation. Now, I haven't got a problem with that. Okay, I haven't got a problem with that because you've got a preacher there. The preacher is explaining and expounding the book of Romans okay, to the unbeliever. So a person, yeah, a person can be saved, but I would strongly encourage you to use verses in John. John 3.16, John 3.18, you know, John 1.12, things like that. And uh, because it's, it's written in a way where the unbeliever can really understand. It's written easily, okay, where it actually, the natural man can understand that more so than other parts of the Bible. I really encourage you to do that, uh, to fill it in. Because I don't believe someone can read the Romans road and be saved, like on its own. But I believe if someone has the book of John with them, yes, they can be saved uh, with that. Again, but if you've got the Romans road, if that's what you're used to, but you're the preacher, you're expanding that, yeah, they can be saved because they have someone that is teaching them those things. You know, the Ethiopian eunuch, all, all he had was Isaiah. You know, an unsaved man cannot understand Isaiah unless they have a preacher there to expound that truth to them. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man, now, what does it mean to judge all things? Well, this is where comparing Scripture with Scripture, comparing spiritual with spiritual, because back to verse 14, it was about discernment. It's about discerning things. When it says that he that is spiritual judges all things, it's meaning that he discerns all things. He can understand all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. So the natural man cannot judge the believer or cannot discern the believer. He doesn't understand the believer, right? What I mean by that is, you might have people that don't understand why you spend an hour and a half or more hours in church every Sunday, right? You know, I, you know I've pretty much my whole life I've given to the church, and when people find out, they don't understand. You give of your finances to the church? They don't understand. You know, you go to church? You preach, you know, you, you go knock doors? I don't understand. You know, you try to live, you know, you, you don't like, you know, looking at, you know, um, you know, women in bikinis at the beach. I don't understand that. I don't, that's the natural man. They don't understand why the spiritual man, they don't understand why the believer is a certain way. You know, they don't understand why that person is trying to be like Christ. They don't understand why they're trying to follow the steps of Christ. They cannot judge that man. They cannot discern that man because they don't have the Spirit of God. But we can judge all things. We can discern all things because we have the Word of God. We have the Holy Spirit. Now, if you, if you remember this, um, uh, well, actually, let's read verse 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Okay, we have the mind of Christ. I, I just want to point out just a few things here to connect to last week's sermon. Verse 15 says, we who are spiritual can judge all things, right? Can judge all things. But look at verse 16. It talks about having us, us having the mind of Christ. Now, if you remember back last week, 
I'll just read to you in our memory verse. Remember, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, you can just go back and have a look at it yourself. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you. So how can we have unity in the church? Remember that? How can we have unity? But that ye are perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Okay, so judgment and mind, having the same judgment, having the same mind, is what gets, gives us the unity in the church. But then in chapter 2, Paul now describes that judgment, right? We're able to judge because we have the Spirit of God. We're saved, we judge, we read the Word of God, we understand the things that the Holy Ghost teaches us, and we have the mind of Christ. If you're saved, you have the mind of Christ. That's what it means, okay? It doesn't mean you have to have Kevin's mind, you have to have Callum's mind, you have to have Jason's judgment. No, we have the judgment that's found in the, in the Word of God, and we have the mind of Christ who is in us, who gives us His power through His Holy Spirit, through the Holy Spirit. Um, so, this is what's going to differentiate you from the world. This is when the world looks at you and cannot discern, cannot understand why you are the way you are. The reason for it is because you have the mind of Christ. Okay? Now, the mind of Christ is something that develops over time. As you grow in, this, in the faith, as you mature in the Lord, the mind of Christ will develop further in you. You will grow to be more like Christ. Right? You'll develop and be more Christ-like as you grow in the Lord. Turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I'm almost done. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Because having the mind of Christ is a process. We receive it the moment you're saved, but your mind becomes more like Christ's the more you grow and develop. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world. Why? Because in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it says we don't have the spirit of the world. Right? God doesn't want us to be conformed. He doesn't want us to be comfortable in this world. He doesn't want us to be just like this world. He doesn't want this church to be worldly. Okay? Do not be conformed. Do not become acceptable of the world and being just like the world. But be ye transformed, transform, change, grow, mature, transform yourselves by the renewing of your mind. Your mind needs to change. Your mind needs to be renewed. Your mind needs to be transformed to be like the mind of Christ, that ye may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This process of maturing is your Christian walk. Okay? If you're a Christian and you're becoming more worldly, I'm concerned for you because you're becoming conformed to the world. But if you're a Christian and you're becoming more godly, you're becoming more Christ-like, you're having more... That's a great thing. That's what God wants from us, right? And don't think for a minute, just because you're saved, you're going to be this super Christian. Okay? And I, and I just really hate it when people who have been saved for a long time stick their noses up and look at other Christians that aren't as mature as they are. Okay? Because they, they put them down, they criticize other Christians for not being just like them as far as their spiritual growth. Look how they're dressed. Look how they speak. Look what they're doing. Hey, encourage that person to renew their mind. Instead of, being a, uh, instead of discouraging them and, and making them feel worthless, encourage them. Build them up. Isn't that what we read about serving one another, submitting ourselves to one another? That ought to be the way you are. Stop criticizing every Christian that you come across because they're not up at your level. In fact, if that's you, then it's probably because you're conformed to the world, because that, that's what the world is like. The world is a place that criticizes other people, okay, rather than lifting them up and building them up to be more like Christ. It's a process. Renewing your mind is a process that you need to do. It's maturity. You grow. There are, there are things in your life probably right now that you think is just fine, it's not that bad, it's not that distracting, it's not that sinful. There's going to come a time in your life when you're like, hold on, actually it is. You know why? Because your mind's been renewed. Your mind's been changed. You've read the Word of God. The Holy Spirit has been teaching you things. And in time, you're going to realize things that you do today that you're quite comfortable with. In time, you're going to be like, oh, you know what? I probably shouldn't have been doing that. I shouldn't have been encouraging other Christians to be doing that either. You know? I don't really have anything in my mind right now, but I'm just saying that's what the Bible, Bible teaches, right? Direction is the key. Which way are you going in your mind? Are you going toward Christ and His mind? Are you being transformed to be more like Him? Or are you going this way and conforming to the world? You know, again, we want to be a united church. 
We need to have the same judgment found in this book, taught by the Holy Spirit, and the same mind to be the mind of Christ. Okay, let's pray.